Good evening. A catchy title, Did Goldman Sachs Kill Silicon Valley Bank? Not legal advice. Certainly not legal advice tonight. Share, subscribe, like, and comment. Perhaps someday we will see each other at the courthouse. It, won't that be fun? Uh, this is pure speculation and opinion based on the facts as I know them. As such, it is just opinion, and I could be swayed with new facts. I'm certainly not asserting that Goldman Sachs did anything illegal as far as I know, but as you can analyze for yourself, and I'd like you to think about it, they seemingly played a role in the dem demise of Silicon Valley Bank and the damages that have arisen from that to all of us so far. When I attended law school with Abraham Lincoln, in essence, what we were taught was to issue spot. You would look at the fact pattern and try and spot the potential problems. That is part of what the bar exam inquires about. In fact, back before electricity was invented, I was in law school and we were taught IRAC, issue, rule, application, and conclusion. That was a way of analyzing legal issues. You would spot the issue, assert the law or rule that applied, apply it to your facts, and then draw a conclusion. So let's issue spot, issue, issue spot a little bit about Silicon Valley Bank. I've already asserted that there's plenty of apparent blame to go around for multiple parties. Management for creating the mess, the Federal Reserve by raising interest rates probably too high and probably too quickly enough to break something, poor regulatory oversight, what a shock, the lack of management or partners of Silicon Valley Bank to go to the government prior to the bank run to seek assistance, depositors overly concentrating positions above FDIC insurance limits, the FDIC le insurance limits being too low, and a host of other issues. But what, if anything, was Goldman Sachs' role? And did they, and this is a question I'm asking, did they go to the government prior to the bank run? And you will see the relevance as we go through a little bit of the history. We all know that because of the amount of assets placed by Silicon Valley Bank in long-term instruments at low interest rates, that that created a loss for Silicon Valley Bank. Because of the need for cash, however, they elected to sell those long-term instruments or a portfolio of those instruments. Now, what's interesting about that is if they hadn't sold the instruments, the loss would not have been recognized. And in fact, the sale of those instruments may have in fact helped uh, exacerbate the panic that led to the bank run. So, Silver Valley, Silver, Silicon Valley Bank sold the portfolio of securities that is now apparently worth approximately $24 billion at the current high interest rates for $21.45 billion. So that equates to an approximate 11% haircut at the current high interest rates. Now, obviously, the value of bonds and long-term securities are inverse to the interest rates. So the higher the interest rates, the lower the value of that security and vice versa. So when interest rates drop in the future, these long-term instruments are likely to be worth more than the $24 billion book value. So it was probably a good deal for the buyer, Goldman Sachs. Now, just because that happened, that's not overly meaningful, right? Perhaps Goldman Sachs got a good deal, but so what? Well, it also turns out, coincidentally, that Goldman Sachs was contracted to obtain the emergency financing for and with 
Silicon, Silicon Valley Bank that they needed to stay afloat. But Goldman Sachs was unable to, to secure that despite their power and capital. Was that because they did not want to secure the capital? Were they er eradicating a competitor? Is Goldman Sachs or an affiliate or investment arm or fund going to take over the vacant spot left by the departure of Silicon Valley Bank? I do not know. I'm just asking dumb questions. That's, that's all I'm here for. But in a law school exam, and for the purposes of this video, we would look at the facts and we'd argue both sides. So we would say, on one hand, and we would argue based upon all, everything, Goldman Sachs acted, did not act criminally and they didn't act unethically. And then we might argue on the other side um, that Goldman Sachs acted criminally and didn't act eth ethically. But, but again, I'm just speculating, just opinion. I don't know all the facts. But if we were in law school, that's kind of how we would do it. We'd kind of look at both sides and make arguments both ways. Was the federal government aware of Goldman Sachs' full involvement? And did they limit or condition any fees or compensation that Goldman Sachs received? And how about the potential future business that Goldman Sachs might receive? Doesn't this smack of a potential conflict of interest? Oh, by the way, and for your old timers, this is what Columbo would say. Additionally, there was one other point. At, at someone's request, Goldman Sachs also facilitated the trading of over $700 million of distressed Silicon Valley Bank bonds to investors over the weekend after the run on the bank. I'm not sure if Goldman Sachs did that for free. I'll let you decide. I don't know about also, and this is just a question, I don't know what Goldman Sachs connection is to federal regu regulators, to Gary Gensler, to the FDIC, etc. But Interesting questions, and I hope you, you look into them. So to summarize as I see it and to let you all ponder, so Goldman Sachs got a sweet deal on some long-term assets, helped trade Silicon Valley Bank bonds likely for profit, but could not arrange financing to keep Silicon Valley Bank afloat. Interesting. Think about it. Good night.